Francisco was just a fabulous place to live. There were so many wonderful things happening there uh, then, and uh, I decided to open a restaurant. <laughs> well, that sounds good. And uh, now, so I'm assuming that you've made a shift in your thinking about food, that what you're eating today, you were actually not eating that in 1975. No, I I had um, a long history of many health problems, uh, I would say, all the way along. And to begin with, my mother had serious mental illness, schizophrenia. I suffered from depression most of my adult life, didn't know the reason for that. And I really didn't understand for many, many years uh, that what I was eating was probably contributing to a myriad, myriad of symptoms and depression. So it wasn't mm -hmm. until 2009, and I was living in Hood River, Oregon, and I had an opportunity to meet Nora Goodgaudis, who wrote Primal Body, Primal Mind, uh, that I began to change my diet. Uh, she did a lot of testing on me, and I had very low vitamin D levels. I was hypoglycemic. Uh, all these uh, variety of symptoms. So the way she started with me was to take me off sugar. And most of my sugar came in the form of cookies, scones, muffins, breads, all that stuff. And I realized now that a lot of my uh, sugar issues were actually uh, wheat gluten issues as well. And I found out recently that I was gluten intolerant, uh, intolerant to soy, egg, and... Um, a few other things. So and, it's and, been a, a long haul of figuring this out. And you're saying that when you modified your regime and stopped eating certain foods, that you just felt just better in general. Okay, this is this is really uh, what happened. We initially took me off sugar. Uh, I was living with quite a few vegetarians at the time. So that was a problem to begin to start eating meat again mm -hmm. uh, and fish. And I had about three months of withdrawal uh, from sugar and, I believe, from gluten. Um, so I was having a lot of very uncomfortable withdrawal symptoms. And then, um, well, also I was eating more fat. So I was incorporating more eggs into the diet, butter, coconut oil, all of that, mm -hmm. which actually I, th I think helped uh, cut the cravings or the the withdrawal symptoms quite a lot. Um, it wasn't until about three months later into eating this way that I realized, wow, I I feel better now. Uh, I'm, I'm not craving as much. I have more energy. And uh, the biggest thing for me is the depression uh, lifted, uh, I would say, within three months. Uh, I hadn't taken any kind of medication for a number of years. Uh, years ago, I had been on two, two medications, and I have to say they didn't help all that much. They didn't help me get over the root cause of the depression, which mm -hmm. I feel was my diet. Oh, well, well okay. Uh, so that, that, that's, that seems important. Now, you also mentioned the term hypoglycemia. What does that mean? Well, I think I had suffered from hypoglycemia as far back as I can remember, certainly in high school, uh, maybe even earlier. I, I called it low blood sugar. But my pattern was to skip breakfast in the morning because I wasn't hungry. Uh, and so about 11 o'clock, I would f honestly f be shaking and feeling like I was going to faint. And mm. naturally, I couldn't think straight. I probably had some ADD related issues as well. But when I started to eat uh, more fat, more protein, sustained during the day, every meal, uh, the hypoglycemia disappeared. I'm no longer hypoglycemic. So you're saying that hypoglycemia is not a structural problem, it's a lifestyle problem. Yes. I think we develop hypoglycemia very early on. In fact, in our culture, I would say we we get babies on uh, uh, cereals right away, and that that uh, those sugared cereals and grains uh, definitely begin a hypoglycemic process from the get-go. All right. Now I see that you're going to have a cooking demo for us. I do see salmon in one of the bowls, and uh, is that an important food that I should uh, try to eat? 
Well, I believe it is. And uh, salmon, of course, ha has uh, omega-3 fatty acids. It's one of the most important uh, nutrients for the brain. And our ancestors, uh, their diet and the reason why we're speaking to each other as humans today was probably because of the high fat, uh, omega-3 fatty acid content in, in the foods that we were consuming during Paleolithic times. Wild animals ate the grasses, their meat and fats, uh, fat had the omega-3 fatty acids in it. So they were eating uh, omega-3s all day long. Mm -hmm. Now that we have commercially raised beef and unfortunately farmed fish, um, uh, the the beef that's being raised today are fed grains, so their meat and fat is being converted to omega-6 fatty acids. So we are not getting omega-3s when we're eating commercially raised uh, meat products. I see. I see. Now, you mentioned that you would go to high school, no breakfast. So uh, is breakfast an important meal? I would say, and a lot of uh, nutritionists say this, uh, breakfast is the most important meal. And and for parents now who are sending their children off to school, giving them good protein with really good fats in the morning is very important. So uh, eggs, butter. <laughs> salmon. I could have salmon for breakfast. Yeah, of salmon. course. You can have salmon for breakfast, meat, meats for breakfast in an omelet or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so if I eat a nice piece of salmon for breakfast or a couple of eggs or a piece of chicken, how long will that sustain my blood sugar before I really need to eat again? Um, well, this is uh, this is kind of important to understand. A lot of people think that the paleo diet is the caveman diet or the Atkins diet. And we really don't need huge slabs of meat or fish. We need about two, three, maybe four ounces, really, uh, to get us through to the next meal mm -hmm. with sufficient fats, almost an equal amount of fats, too. And the fats will keep us from, from being hungry. But the protein will sustain our energy. All right, so protein sustains blood sugar. Yes. All right. And the fats, too. And the fats, too. Yes, together. And what are you what are you preparing for us today? Well, I've made the salmon salad niçoise out of my cookbook, and uh, I got everything ready, which you can do. It's a meal that you can kind of put together ahead of time. That's what makes it so nice, and you can have it for lunch or dinner or in the summertime. So should I toss the salad? Yeah, please show us. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, this is a balsamic and garlic and olive oil dressing balsamic olive oil and garlic okay yeah very simple it has some capers in it and for those of you just tuning in we're speaking with uh paul halstead who uh has written a new cookbook called primal cuisine also entitled cooking for the paleo diet and paulie is a restaurateur who's been working in the profession since 1975 and so she uh, knows her stuff So that seems uh, pretty simple. It's just greens and uh, salmon. Yeah, uh, we eat a lot of greens every day. Uh, they're an important part of our diet. Actually, I would think the way I've designed the book, it's a vegetarian diet with small amounts of meat and fish. So a lot of vegetables. Well, that's a nice characterization. Yeah. Do the vegetarians buy into that one? Uh I don't know. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> if they eat if they eat some fish, I wouldn't be a, a strict vegan uh, anymore. I wouldn't recommend that. I know some people are, but I think it's very important to have animal fats, especially from grass-fed animals. And uh, actually, I, I agree seafood. with you. I, I think the animal fats turn out to be terribly important. Very right. And I think the vegetarians are well-intentioned. And I think maybe for a cancer patient, it might be a good time to be a vegetarian. But in general, I think the animal fats uh, do make an important component uh, of our diet. Yes. And I I feel it is uh, still important to address the uh, issue of kindness to animals. And so in my book, I recommend that all animals are humanely raised and they're raised on pasture and not put in pens. So it's still, you can do this and still pay attention to those kinds of issues. And those kind of issues of animal rights, naturally people are paying attention to that. Whereas 30 or 40 years ago, people might have simply laughed at the whole concept and now they recognize, oh yes, that cruelty to animals is a bad thing. So we've made a lot of progress. I think the vegetarians 
are responsible for that, as a matter of fact. I like to think the vegetarians push the consciousness of the, co of the country forward on that one. I agree. And we have a lot of producers now in California who are really paying attention, too. So I came across a producer in the Napa Valley. My, my daughter and her husband uh, work for Long, Long Meadow Ranch, and they had one of the first herds of uh, grass-fed cows. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, where are they? They're in uh, St. Helena. Actually, they opened what I believe is the first, uh, one of the first restaurants in the United States that has um, meat exclusively from their ranch uh, and its farmstead restaurant in St. Helena. Well, that's actually a nice fresh concept, isn't it? So that's yeah. from farm to table for sure. Yeah. Let absolutely. me have that address once again. Farmstead Restaurant mm -hmm. in St. Helena and its Long Meadow Ranch. Okay, great. Great. So what are you doing there? Well, I'm cutting uh, a few pastured eggs up here to decorate the salad with. But as you can see, it's really pretty. I like a lot of color in the salad mm -hmm. and a lot of crunchy stuff. So um, you can use your favorite things. And Polly, what are the greens you're using in the dish? Well, I really love lettuce greens. So I, I always use a combination. This has oregano. I mean, not oregano. Arugula, spring mix, and spinach. Mm-hmm. So we have a big salad every day for lunch with everything all mixed up, lots of crunchy stuff. Well, that actually sounds like a very nice uh, meal. And how long does it take you to prepare all that? Not long. Um, I I have a lot of dressing recipes in mm. my cookbook, so I I usually have a number of them in the refrigerator depending on the salad we want to have for lunch. I always have all the greens and all the vegetables I like in the refrigerator. And so I can make a salad in five minutes. <laughs> right. So, so it's actually and, so it's pretty yeah, fast. With pretty leftover fast. meat or fish from the night before, it's it's nice to make a little extra um, the night before. Then you have it to dive into the lunch the next day. And your book, Prime of Cuisine, is that that's a pretty new book, isn't it? It's brand new. It actually it came out a little early. It came out right before Thanksgiving, and it's been doing very well. You can buy it at Barnes and Noble. And Amazon also? Amazon, Amazon too, oh. and a lot of bookstores. It's it's really sailing off the shelves. I'm so pleasantly well, that's pleased. That's very nice. <laughs> that's very nice. And what about your website? How can I contact you directly? Okay, my website is uh, theprimalcuisine.com, and I also have a Facebook page, which is the title of the book, Primal Cuisine, Cooking for the Paleo Diet. And I'm al always posting a lot of recipes on there, a lot of new latest ideas, and uh, all kinds of things that are of interest. So check out my Facebook page. Polly, I do have a question that I think might be a little bit uh, controversial, and I noticed that in the in your book Promo Cuisine and the, the discussion of the eating what what you feel is healthy uh, eating that uh, besides not using processed sugar which most people would agree yes processed sugar is not a good choice most people would agree i think with that i noticed that you have de-emphasized the use of grains and can you comment on that yes historically um we didn't eat grains as we evolved and now uh they are able to show that once the advent of eating grains happened, we started to get the diseases of Western civilization. And actually, our brains uh, started to shrink, our skeleton, and uh, most recently, uh, uh, we've had a lot of problems with, with our teeth and cavities and, and teeth coming in crooked and all these things. So. With the advent of grains, I would say our health started to deteriorate. And now we have processed grains, which are even worse. And processed grains convert to sugar almost immediately when uh, they get uh, into the stomach and into the bloodstream. So um, they're c causing obesity and diabetes. And that's what we're seeing in our population today. So I would definitely eliminate grains, which is a really radical thing for people. We are really addicted to our carbohydrates. And, and, uh, so, you know, it's a little bit of a learning curve and you just have to, uh, try it and see what you feel like. I would say the most important grain to get off of immediately is wheat, genetically modified wheat. I think uh, uh, you could try that first and see how you feel, but I guarantee you, uh, you know, it's going to make a difference. So you're saying grain, you meaning wheat, rye, oats, corn, and barley, in your opinion, are problematic? Uh, 
Uh, yes, and actually uh, there are test, tests you can uh, get now, lab tests. Nora recommends them in her book, Intero Lab. And I had that test last spring, and that showed I was allergic to gluten, soy, egg, and dairy casein. Mm -hmm. And then I went a step further and got a test with Cyrex Labs, and, and that shows 24 other foods that your body can mistake for gluten. So with people who have been taken off gluten and casein, like uh, autistic children, and they're still having symptoms, then this this additional testing might be necessary to find out the other problems. What are those labs again that you like? Intero Lab mm -hmm. and Cyrex Lab, and you can go on their websites. They have great websites uh, where they describe all the tests they do and the results and everything. Uh, so I would read up on that. Alrighty. And if I was to avoid any grains with gluten, and I'm looking for something to eat with my salmon or chicken turkey or lamb. What about using a sweet potato or baked squash? How about those? Okay. Uh, well, um, the sort of there are certain uh, vegetables that Nora kind of recommend uh, re recommended not to eat mm -hmm. uh, that are higher in sugar. So I specifically left those out of my uh, cookbook, um, except maybe for carrots, but. Um, if you are hypoglycemic or diabetic, then I would not tend to eat those. Uh, what can I eat then? On so, a normal so, so Nora oh, okay. recommends well, no sweet potatoes. Is that it? No, no. Pretty much, okay. she would recommend not eating any sweet potatoes, um, just because of the high sugar content. So, so that I'll, Nora doesn't sound like a ball of fun, does she? I don't know, really. You know what I mean? <laughs> so no sweet potatoes. Okay. <laughs> And so I can use, how about a baked squash? Can I do baked squash? Well, I do have a recipe in the book for spaghetti squash. I mm -hmm. feel like that has less squash, is it? Uh, less uh, sugar in it than, than, say, a butternut or a Hubbard squash or some, one of those. All righty. And Polly, how again can we, uh, Polly Halstead, uh, our guest now, our new cookbook, uh, Primal Cuisine, how can we contact you? Well, you can go on my website. All my contact information is on the website, and that's uh, theprimalcuisine.com. Also, you could uh, email me. It's cuisineforwholehealth at gmail.com. All righty. Uh, I do have one uh, question. I noticed you have a lemon there and the vegetables. So, again, you prefer to use only organically grown fruits and vegetables. Is that correct? Absolutely organic. Um, and organic means what exactly? That means not sprayed with pe uh, any pesticides. All right. And they have to pass certification on that, so they're third-party certified. Yes. Um, there's there's a whole lot of issues now with or organic food, and unfortunately some people are cheating uh, as far as that goes. Uh, you can raise your own or know your grower. I would suggest going to uh, the local farmer's market. Usually those guys are are pretty well screened as far as organic goes. And you mentioned that your daughter and son-in-law have a ranch. What's the name of that again? Oh, uh, well, no, they lived on the ranch, and they helped manage the herd of cows on Long Meadow Ranch. So that's how I first learned about grass-fed cows. And grass-fed? And that was in the early 90s. And grass-fed means what? All they eat is pastured grass. They are not fed any grains at all. They are not finished on grains. And when you go to the grocery store, and you're looking for grass-fed meat, it's very important to ask uh, the guy behind the counter, are they grain-finished? Because mm -hmm. you do not want them grain-finished. Because the cattle don't do well on grain? It converts their meat and, and fat to omega-6 fatty acid. And we get too much omega-6. That's right. So totally pastured all and, the way through. And the idea of totally pastured ca uh, cattle... That seems to be kind of catching on, isn't it? Well, especially here in, in California, there's a lot of producers now, and actually this movement uh, sort of uh, upstarted again in the, in the 90s, and now it's really catching on around the country, but California has been a leader in, in uh, starting to, to pasture the cows all the way through again. We have Nevada County free-range beef up where we live. And you think it tastes better as a chef? Absolutely, without a doubt. Um, 
just salt and pepper before you grill or or saute it and it tastes wonderful it has a great flavor wow well paula halstead author of primal cuisine cooking for the paleo diet thank you for being a guest today on here's to your health it's been uh, great fun and seems very simple and very doable very simple and again we can get your cookbook at amazon and local cookbook stores and Barnes and, no- Barnes and Noble, Noble, they're going to feature it on, in February and March. So go to the Barnes and Noble website. Yeah. Well, that sounds very good. Yeah. That sounds very good. Uh, we're going to take a very short break, and we'll be right back after these important messages. And thank you for listening to Here's to Your Health. Are you tired of getting sick and tired? Are you tired of doctors not knowing what's wrong with you? D Herbs may have the answer. D Herbs, number one in herbal remedies. D Herbs' main goal is to enlighten and properly educate people to the importance of human health and nutrition. D Herbs, home of the full body cleanse. Everyone needs to cleanse. If you eat meat and dairy products, you need to cleanse. If you're eating processed foods, you need to cleanse. 90% of today's diseases that we suffer from are diet related. Cleansing opens the door to healing and rejuvenation. Whether you need help with a chronic disease, weight loss, or to jumpstart and eliminate fatigue, D Herbs Full Body Cleanse can help. There's a better way to live and healthier way to live. Experience healing. Visit us at dherbs.com. That's D H E R B S.com. Or call us at 866 434 3727. That's 866 434 3727. Hi, this is Susan Levin, owner and founder of Speaker Services, inviting you to join me and co host Jean Noel Bassiar on Monday evenings, 5 p.m. Pacific, for our new show, Talk Up Your Business, Speak Your Way to More Profits. We'll be talking to you about how to use your expertise to grow your business or service through speaking. Our expert speakers and author guests will share their stories and success secrets with you. Don't forget to tune in to Talk Up Your Business, Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific, exclusively on latalklive.com. You can also catch us on iTunes Radio R&B or watch us on Ustream.tv. Reality radio handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is L.A. Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. Hi, this is Dr. Levi, your fitness doctor, making a personal house call, inviting you to join me Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. For my all-new show, The Dr. Levi Show, join us as we discuss fitness, health, and well-being, including emotional and spiritual health. So don't forget to tune in to The Dr. Levi Show every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, exclusively on LATalkLive.com and the Talk Live Broadcast Network. You can also catch us on iTunes, Radio R&B, or watch us on Ustream.tv or catch us on the Live 365 Network, and now on Radio Flag and Stitcher Radio. Reality Radio handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is L.A. Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. Joshua Lane, member of the board of directors of Dr. Anne Wigmore's Hippocrates Health Institute, Josh Lane was part of the Dr. Anne Wigmore team that brought wheatgrass, sprouts, and raw foods to a worldwide audience. And now the host of Here's to Your Health on LA Talk Live, Joshua Lane. We're back. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Here's to Your Health on the LA Talk Live radio network. I'm your host, Joshua Lane. And our next guest, Martin Lee, has written a book on uh, cannabis, cannabis sativa, uh, commonly called marijuana. And the Martin Lee book uh, called Smoke Signals is newly out and has enjoyed some very good reviews from a surprisingly 
diverse crowd of influential people, including Andrew Weil. And actually, of all people, uh, William S. Burroughs, uh, which is an interesting person. Uh, I didn't even realize Mr. Burroughs was still living. And, of course, John Sale, the, the director, the film director. And uh, is Martin on the line? No, he's going to be calling in shortly. I hope he's uh, uh, there, sh uh, there soon. Excuse me. Uh, but the book is called Smoke Signals, and uh, recently, of course, there has been some discussion about the legalization of cannabis sativa, uh, commonly called marijuana, and two states recently, including Colorado, have just passed it, and there has been much controversy uh, with Los Angeles County uh, prohibiting these uh, centers from distributing uh, cannabis sativa or marijuana to patients who have the medical marijuana cards. And some of the problems have been that these centers are denied uh, proper licensing by the city and they are unable to get insurance and the landlords don't want them uh, to be in their space. And also the banking institutions don't necessarily want them to bank through them. And so oftentimes they're denied the ability to have a MasterCard Visa American Express machine. And so these businesses deal strictly in cash and because they deal strictly in cash they are a target for gangsters who like to rob and so it has been a problem and of course we do know that some legislators including uh, Barney Frank and Congress and uh, Ron Paul uh, obviously diverse uh, opinions they have favored the legalization of uh, cannabis sativa uh, also uh, called marijuana. And uh, so it is a uh, popular, it's an important question now, and uh, as this is a wellness show and the cannabis is used, possibly some people feel that it is very helpful for cancer patients. And in the book, in Martin Lee's book, uh, Smoke Signals, there is some discussion about some young children who are sick with cancer who are using uh, cannabis uh, brownies and how they did not have nausea and vomiting and how the other children in the hospital situation were not using cannabis, although the physicians were allowing them to use it. They were not, of course, prescribing it, but they knew of its use and they were happy that the children that were using it uh, were not suffering the ill effects from the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy they were getting. Martin? Martin's not. Alrighty. Uh, and the, the Martin Lee book uh, also talks about the history of the subject. And uh, we're just going to wait for Mr. Lee to give us a phone uh, call. Uh, he's calling in from Northern California. Uh, and uh, if I could mention uh, one of the physician, one of excuse me, one of the researchers, a professor of history at Rice University, uh, has written about the book. Uh, it's an important, serious-minded book, uh, look, uh, giving us a look at the role cannabis has played in American history, and it tackles the hard issues of marijuana prohibition with keen insight and also, he says, righteous indignation. And he agrees with Lee's central premise that our marijuana laws are draconian. And he recommends that uh, every American should read this landmark book. Esther? Uh, further, uh, David Broner, who has the Dr. Broner's soaps, which you've seen everywhere in the United States now. They're very popular. Uh, Dave Broner is writing. He calls it a ripping read, thoroughly researched. Smoke signals will help inform the current debate and hopefully hasten the dis demise of prohibition. And Andrew Weil, important MD, uh, calls the book engaging throughout, at once entertaining and disturbing. And uh, William S. Burroughs has said, let me give his quote, an engrossing account of a period when a tiny psychoactive molecule affected almost every aspect of Western life. So. While we are waiting for Mr. Uh, Lee to give us a call, I'm going to take a very short break, and we're going to be right back after these important messages. Okay. okay. You are now tuned into LA Talk Live. We're more than just talk. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Young Connection, your one-stop connection for all your graphic design and commercial printing needs. 
Young Connection is a full-service printing and media design company dedicated to providing the highest level of customer service and satisfaction. Young Connection provides swift response and rapid turnaround services for banners, brochures, business cards, letterheads, church bulletins, funeral programs, flyers, logo design, posters, and much, much more, all at an affordable price. Young Connection the official printing company of LA Talk Live. Give them a call at 310-491-3336. That's 310-491-3336 or visit their website at www.youngconnection.com. That's www.youngconnection.com. Young Connection Printing and Media Services, proud sponsors of LA Talk Live, where it's more than just talk. Joshua Lane, member of the board of directors of Dr. Anne Wigmore's Hippocrates Health Institute, Josh Lane was part of the Dr. Anne Wigmore team that brought wheatgrass, sprouts, and raw foods to a worldwide audience. And now the host of Here's to Your Health on LA Talk Live, Joshua Lane. We are back, and we are back with our guest Martin Lee, author of the book Smoke Signals, a book uh, about the culture and the use and some of the problems associated with the uh, substance commonly called marijuana, which possibly is more correctly called cannabis sativa. Martin Lee, are you there? Yes, I am. Do you hear me well? I hear you very clearly. Thanks for calling in. Thanks for being a guest today on Here's to Your Health on the LA Talk Live radio network. Now, your book is very nicely done and has enjoyed some very good reviews. And of course, the idea of uh, cannabis sativa or marijuana is certainly everywhere, and there's much discussion about it. And of course, it's a very good book. What would you like to mention right away to our listeners about the use of cannabis sativa? Well, I'm interested first and foremost in the therapeutic uses. Mm -hmm. And cannabis has a very long history, going back several uh, thousand years in terms of its medicinal uses. Um, the first ph pharmacopoeia ever assembled by human beings, a Chinese pharmacopoeia going back to 2700 BC, listed cannabis among the five elixirs of immortality. It was considered a very important medicinal herb in China. And that um, actually is evident in many other cultures as well, in Indian culture, Persian culture, including the United States in the 19th century, a cannabis was widely used as a medicine in the form of tinctures um, uh, taken for many different ailments. Uh, interestingly, both in the Chinese pharmacopoeia several thousand years ago and in the American pharmacopoeia in the 19th century, they listed cannabis as useful for over 100 different conditions. Um, these days, when you hear about cannabis, people say so many different things about it, claiming so many different benefits that it almost appears to be like snake oil to people. And mm -hmm. yet, there is a long history of uses for many reasons, and it is validated by modern science. The research going on uh, gives powerful validation to the experience of many medical marijuana users. And is the word medical marijuana a good term? I was chatting with uh, someone who's very knowledgeable in the field, and this fellow told me that the word marijuana is rather derogatory, that the word cannabis sativa, the word cannabis, in his opinion, was the better term to use. Is that your opinion as well? Well, I can go either way, quite frankly. I mean, marijuana is the most recognizable term, but it's not an English language term. It comes from the Spanish language, and it was first introduced to American society in the 1930s during the Great Depression um, as a part of the Reefer Madness campaign. Federal officials um, basically smeared cannabis by calling it marijuana because they wanted to, to be associated in the American mind with the Mexican immigrants, with people who are on the margins, the poorer people in the society, mm -hmm. aliens right. in terms of the mainstream American life. And that's why the term marijuana was introduced. It really was a racist term, but it's so commonly used these days that I personally don't have a problem with it, though I think in terms of science and medicine, it is more correctly referred to as cannabis. Uh, we're, we're chatting with Martin Lee, the author of a new and popular work called Smoke Signals about the use of marijuana or cannabis sativa. Now, you mentioned in the 19th century that cannabis was used for many ailments. 
what elements was it used for? Well, for starters, it was considered the best um, uh, treatment for migraine headaches. Huh? Uh, marijuana, because of the different compounds in it, is very useful for many different kinds of pain, but particularly migraines. It was Sir William Osler, who's considered uh, in some ways the father of Western medicine. He proclaimed marijuana, or in this case, cannabis, tinctures, as the best use for he headaches. But it was also seen as very helpful for other conditions, arthritis, um, asthma of all things, but again, people weren't smoking it so much back in the 19th century. They were taking it as tinctures that one would, uh, as, a, as a droplets from a liquid. Mm -hmm. um, and these days, the scientific research is indicating that cannabis is potentially useful for even more conditions. Uh, we're familiar with the fact that it's very useful for nausea. I think that's widely known these days, mm -hmm. that for people undergoing chemotherapy, um, which is very, very hard on the body and often produces very violent nausea. Uh, oftentimes, the best remedy for that is just a few, a few puffs of marijuana and the nausea goes away uh, immediately. That's what the anecdotal reports from patients uh, indicate. But there is, again, scientific research that explains why this is so. But uh, these days, there's a lot of talk about uh, certain compounds in marijuana being useful for cancer, not just for dealing with the nausea from chemotherapy, but actually these compounds can reduce the size of tumors, can shrink tumors, wow. and can stop uh, cancer cell pro proliferation and metastasis. And this research uh, showing this is uh, on mainly on animal studies and also on human cell lines. After people die, their cancer cells are kept alive for laboratory research for scientists. And this is a standard practice. And uh, research at the Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, part of the Sutter Medical Group, very mainstream uh, research funded, incidentally, by the federal government, um, has shown that certain compounds, including THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, that's the compound in marijuana that makes people feel high, and other compounds, including a very exciting one, called cannabidiol, otherwise known as CBD, also part of the marijuana plant. It's the only place you can get it in the natural world. It has very powerful anti-tumoral effects. And what's interesting, incidentally, about CBD, it's not psychoactive. It doesn't make people feel high. And when it's combined with THC, it can actually neutralize the, the, um, uh, the psychoactive effects of the THC, which some people find very uncomfortable. Others, they like it. So, you know, it produces a variety of effects with people, marijuana. But the anti-tumoral effects, the anti-cancer effects have now been confirmed by studies throughout the world, in Spain, in Israel, and other countries, not just in the United States. And this is a very exciting area of medical science now, very uh, cutting edge, pioneering, because unlike other uh, chemotherapy agents which destroy cancer cells and wreak havoc on the entire body, cause a lot of damage to people, the, the marijuana compounds have this uncanny ability to destroy just the tumor, just the cancer cells, and leave the healthy cells intact, unscathed. And that's seen as a great advantage, of course. And I should point out that actually pharmaceutical companies are very interested in this. And they're conducting experiments now combining compounds in marijuana with their own chemotherapy agents. And it turns out that oftentimes when combined, it potentiates and makes stronger the first line standard big pharma chemotherapy agents. So you don't have to use as much to have the effect that's desired, and that means you'll have less collateral damage on the body, less harsh side effects. So that is seen as a great advantage, and we may in the near future see combinations of cannabinoids, the compounds in marijuana, together with the standard big pharma chemotherapy agents, and that in itself is a very exciting development. We're speaking with Martin Lee, the author of Smoke Signals a very important new book on marijuana or cannabis sativa. Martin, what prompted you to write about this subject? Well, I was er very interested in marijuana as a cultural phenomenon because it has been um, uh, prominent in, in many different cultures. I mentioned China and India earlier in our conversation. But what's interesting about cannabis is whenever it went from place to place, from culture to culture, 
as it migrated from uh, its homeland in Central Asia in the Kush Mountains, the, the foothills of the Himalayas, and, and, and it was taken by people uh, to ultimately to Africa and from there to the Western Hemisphere, South and North America. It was never rejected by people, never rejected by a culture. It always stayed there and was adapted for many uses. And I found that very interesting. But um, I was also uh, intrigued by the fact that in California and other states, uh, going back to the mid-1990s, it began a phenomenon of the medical marijuana laws being passed, allowing people in those states to use marijuana for therapeutic purposes. And yet, even though these laws were in place in various states, there was a very harsh reaction from law enforcement, not just federal law enforcement, but state and local law enforcement oftentimes sort of teamed up and, for lack of a better word, conspired to um, prevent the implementations of the state laws that permitted the use of medical marijuana. And I thought that was an important story because I was wondering, I live in California, and I was wondering why, after if these laws were passed here, why is law enforcement still cracking down so hard on, on people who obviously were using it for medical purposes? Now, there are others who aren't using it really for medical purposes. They're using it for rec recreational purposes, although sometimes the line between the medical and recreational is blurred. But when you have very obvious examples of people in wheelchairs, chronic pain patients, patients suffering from other severe conditions uh, who are using marijuana with the recommendation from a doctor, I, I, I couldn't understand, well, then why is law enforcement utilizing its resources to attack these people? That's what drew me into the story. And what I had no idea about as a journalist at the time I had no idea about the science behind medical marijuana, that there was a great deal of research validating its therapeutic uses. And that, to me, was a great discovery personally when I learned about that. And that really drew me into the story, and it really opened up a whole new world for me in terms of uh, trying to understand what was happening with the medical marijuana phenomenon. And so you have been interested in the subject, what, for more than the past 10 or so years? Oh, yes. I've been interested for quite a while. Um, I've written several books. They don't all have to do with uh, pharmaceuticals or drugs, but my first book also touched on marijuana as a cultural phenomenon, and that goes back quite a few years. It was called Acid Dreams. The current book is Smoke Signals, and that focuses exclusively on marijuana. And since, okay, since you are an, a journalist and you've been researching the use of uh, cannabis, do you have a thought on if it will be legalized in the next, let me guess, 10, 15, 20 years? Do you think it will be? Well, I think the cultural um, tendency is in that direction. We saw in last November in the state of Washington and Colorado, voters there uh, uh, approved ballot measures legalizing marijuana for adult use without necessarily it having to be pinned to therapeutic uses, just simple mm -hmm. adult use like a wine or beer or something like that. And we'll have to wait to see what happens in these states. But if the example of California and medical marijuana uh, is any precedent, uh, one thing we find in California in 1996, the law was passed, Proposition 215, allowing people to use marijuana for medical purposes. And since that time, it's been now a little more than 16 years, what's striking when you look at the, what happened in California and in the other states that followed with these laws, there's been now a total of 18, um, there has been no pattern of uh, adverse effects from the widespread use of marijuana as a therapeutic agent. There's over a million people in California who have letters from a doctor authorizing them to use marijuana for medical purposes. Now, many of these people may not be having serious illnesses they're coping with, but uh, what's striking is, unlike with the big pharmaceutical uh, companies, when their drugs are approved, more often than not, they have very serious side effects, sometimes lethal effects. You know, we hear this on TV commercials uh, today when they advertise a drug and all the different side effects they're, they caution about, uh, us about. With, with marijuana, we haven't seen these negative side effects emerging, no pattern of, uh, of serious abuse in that way. Now, I'm not saying that across the board it's just a good thing to use marijuana to smoke it, uh, but when you step back and look objectively, 
you don't find uh, a situation like 50,000 people dying from Vioxx, for example, put out by Merck right. as a painkiller. Many right. people use marijuana as a painkiller, but nobody has died from it. So if that situation uh, repeats itself in Washington, Colorado for adult use, I think other states will take heed and we'll see uh, that these experiments, these laboratory experiments in democracy, um, as a Supreme Court Justice of Brandeis of old uh, referred to in situations like this, um, that these experiments will be more or less of a success without undue harm in terms of public health and great advantages in terms of taxing uh, and, and, and uh, filling the coffers of, the, of state treasuries. Uh, you know, that's an advantage that people argue for when they talk about legalizing marijuana. But I think even above and beyond whatever financial or economic benefits are accrued, I think it's likely that there'll be some positive public health benefits because what we've seen in the medical marijuana states is a drop in drunk driving accidents uh, because when people are more like are using more people are using marijuana than less people uh, then there's less alcohol consumption and that's uh, that in and of itself is a positive uh, health benefit but this bears watching we have to see what happens in Washington Colorado if there's no real problems uh, seen then I think what happened there with these votes will repeat in other states in the future and in all likelihood I think we are uh, uh, the tendency is toward legalization, particularly when you consider that younger voters are, uh, are in favor of marijuana legalization in greater numbers. And as more and more younger voters enter the voting block, um, you'll see more favor uh, toward medical, not just medical marijuana, but marijuana in general. We're speaking with Martin Lee, the author of Smoke Signals, and you're listening to us today on the L.A. Talk Live radio network. So, Martin, as a journalist, an investigative journalist working in this sphere, the people who are opposed to the legalization of cannabis, they would say that, indeed, cannabis is a gateway drug, that people do uh, cannabis or marijuana first, and then they, they, they do other drugs. And uh, they're, they're opposed to the legalization of cannabis. Can you comment on their argument, the strength of their argument? Well, there's been several U.S. government-funded studies uh, about marijuana, not just simply scientific studies looking at this or that aspect of what it does molecularly in the brain and so forth, but looking at a broad social landscape. Um, the Institute of Medicine is considered the gold standard uh, in, in terms of scientific research. It's a division of the Nationalist Academy of Sciences. You can't get any more blue ribbon uh, credentials than that. And the, the, their most recent report about marijuana, published in 1998, stated very explicitly and bluntly that it is not a gateway drug that there is no evidence that there's something about marijuana inherently that compels people to take other drugs. And in fact, when you look at surveys, for example, in poor areas, in, in the black and brown ghettos in the United States, mm -hmm. they found that the more people are using marijuana, the less people are using cocaine and heroin. So that's exactly opposite of what the gateway theory would hold. And the study by the Institute of Medicine that I just referred to is not a single study, but this is simply reaffirms what several other studies, both funded by the U.S. government and other governments around the world, have concluded. It's not a gateway drug. It, it's in terms of its addictive properties, it's very mild, something akin to coffee. And in terms of withdrawing from con, uh, from frequent use, the, the the symptoms also are very very mild. That's what the in Institute of Medicine says. So I think the the problem is that the, when marijuana was first introduced to American culture, it was in the context of reefer madness. And while we look back on uh, on that era from the Depression, and, and we can laugh now and say, of course, the idea if a person takes a puff of marijuana doesn't turn them into a crazy, insane, deranged killer, a violent maniac, like it was portrayed in the reefer madness era. And yet, it, there's been sort of a hangover from that area. I, I call it reefer madness light that persists. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. government, unfortunately, the federal government, has spent a great deal of resources trying to buttress the notion that marijuana is, is inherently harmful and without medical value. Um, and yet the policies of the federal government are quite contradictory. So what I would say 
to those who, uh, for understandable reasons, given what we've been exposed to in our society in terms of information and education, people are wary of marijuana because they've heard so many bad things about it. Um, when you consider the contradictory claims and assertions from the U.S. government, I would suggest that federal officials really have long since lost credibility when it comes to marijuana and one should be very, very careful about accepting at face value what anybody says, whether it's federal officials or advocates. Uh, there's a great deal of information out there. Uh, one could research it on the internet. I try to prevent, present a lot of information in smoke signals that's well documented and footnoted. Um, so I think that's just a matter of time as people become more used to and acclimated with marijuana being either semi-legal or legal, uh, people will be less um, uh, kind of freaked out about it and, and, and fearful about what it may, it may entail. I think a lot of this is based on propaganda that's been repeated by the federal government. And unfortunately, the, the, the side effect, if you will, of all that has been to deny um, uh, uh, great possibilities in terms of the therapeutic potential of marijuana. Uh, because the, while the government has funded certain kinds of scientific research aimed at discrediting marijuana. It has prevented studies uh, dealing uh, mainly with human subjects. But what the animal studies on, what the preclinical research funded by the U.S. government ironically ended up showing was that marijuana has a great deal of therapeutic utility. And that's not what the U.S. government set out to prove, but ironically, that's what ended up happening. Well, that's actually very interesting. Uh, for those of you tuning in, we are speaking with Martin Lee, the author of Smoke Signals. Uh, Martin, I have a question, uh, possibly a loaded question. If the ideas you were mentioning about the benefit of medical marijuana or cannabis, the research is in, who, what group or individuals lose if marijuana or cannabis is legalized? I think first and foremost, law enforcement loses because at this point, you know, law enforcement depends on marijuana arrests to make their budget. They get a great deal of uh, uh, money from the federal government, specifically earmarked to enforce marijuana laws. And part of those laws entail the right for law enforcement uh, to actually seize the property of suspected marijuana violators, not people who are convicted of crimes, people who are suspected of benefiting from uh, trafficking in marijuana, uh, they can have their property seized, they can have their uh, not just their house, their car, their jewelry, et cetera. And oftentimes, this, is, this material is very, very difficult to get back uh, for the individual, even if they're exonerated in the courts. So uh, the, over half the police departments in the United States rely on the marijuana prohibition to make their budgets. Now, there are other entities and forces in society that I would put on a list of suspects, but you can't really prove anything. You know, certain people suggest, well, the alcohol industry, they stand a lot to lose if marijuana is legalized. And I think, well, yes and no. You know, marijuana and alcohol have coexisted for thousands of years. Um, maybe people will drink a little bit less, but that's what a lot of people like to do, and they're not going to stop drinking. You know, we have a society that's sort of drowning in alcohol. Mm -hmm. So that won't go away if marijuana is legalized. And the same thing with the big pharmaceutical companies. While it is true that if people use marijuana for therapeutic purpose, that they tend to use less conventional pharmaceuticals. But I think there'll always be a place for uh, pharmaceutical medications, even though I, as, uh, as an individual, as a citizen, you know, lean toward the holistic therapies and preventative medicine, and I emphasize that for myself, I think there's always situations you're going to need sophisticated, modern medicines that the pharmaceutical world produces. Um, but, so I think the pharmaceutical companies can coexist perfectly well with legalized marijuana, because the fact of the matter is millions of people already use marijuana in the United States. So if the law changes, will more people use it? Oh, probably. Um, but if that results in people drinking less alcohol, I see that as a net benefit for society. Martin, this is a very interesting uh, conversation that encompasses you know, many areas in American society. Now, you made a very strong statement a few, sec a few minutes ago that the police departments, by seizing property, get a certain percentage of their budget. If they were unable, if, mar if medical marijuana, if cannabis was legal and they couldn't 
seize property, would they not get tax money from the cannabis that is legally sold and taxed in, say, CVS or the grocery store or the pharmacy? It could be. You know, it, 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 you'd have to uh, defer to the state governments to decide how those tax monies are allocated or the federal government if it comes down to that. Um, but I think that um, in terms of police departments, you know, I should point out that there is an organization, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, of former police and law enforcement officials who are opposed to marijuana prohibition and who favor its legalization. Uh, and, you know, if you, there's probably a lot of police that actually feel that way, but don't, they can't admit it because they're on the job. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at the, simply the numbers of how many people are still arrested every year for marijuana violations, it's over three quarters of a million people last year were arrested, mainly for possession, 95%. Excuse me, Martin, is this, is this nationwide? I, excuse me, I, I couldn't quite hear what you, you said. You said three quarters of a million people arrested. Is that nationwide? Yes, nationwide, okay. three quarters of a million people were arrested in 2012 uh, for uh, marijuana violations. And mainly, we're talking 90 to 95 percent, just simple possession. We're not talking about traffickers. We're not talking about kingpins. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at those numbers, you realize that that forms the bulk of what we call the drug problem in America. And if you if you remove the marijuana from the equation, you know, the, the, the illegal drug problem in America, while significant, looks a whole lot smaller, you know. And then you have to wonder then, well, well why are $40 billion a year being allocated to deal with a problem that is a whole lot smaller in terms of simply the numbers when you take marijuana out of the picture? You'd have to reallocate the budget. The police couldn't get so much money for, for uh, focusing on the drug war. And you'd have to have a shakeup in that way. And I think that that would be a good thing because I think a lot of this money is wasted at this point. Um, obviously, you have drug abuse in American society. The worst problems are alcohol and pharmaceutical opiates, addictive mm -hmm. opiates. We, we recognize that now. Now, Oxycontin, these highly addictive, it's essentially synthetic heroin. In fact, they call it hillbilly heroin, heroin in a pill. These are legally available, um, yet they're widely abused. And, and um, this, to me, is a serious problem. That This is where the focus should be and not on marijuana, which is, in terms of its addictive properties, mild, if addictive at all. And my, it's my feeling that you know, mar when you talk about marijuana as being addictive, it's really no more addictive than food is addictive in the sense of causing compulse. Food doesn't cause compulsive eating. Marijuana doesn't cause a person to become addicted. It's a, it's a kind of a skewed way of looking at addiction. And I think the, the fact that it's emphasized this way by certain agencies in the government who claim marijuana is addiction, it's kind of a holdover from the reefer madness era. And what we find is a lot of allegations that are made in terms of alleged negative effects of marijuana. Uh, turn, turn out simply not to be uh, tr uh, true. We heard recently the past year, marijuana use among young people will lower IQ. Uh, well, it turns out the study was flawed, and that just came out recently showing how, and it has a lot to do with economic status. People who are impoverished are going to have lower IQs, not because they're inherently less smart, because IQs are a social reading, not just an individual brain reading. So I think we have to be very cautious about when we hear pronouncements from federal officials. And I'll give you, you know, just one quick example of the contradictions. You know, the government today claims that marijuana is a dangerous drug with no medical value. Yet the same government, the federal government, gives 300 pre-rolled marijuana cigarettes to four Americans who are considered a medical necessity cases. Every month they receive a tin can with 300 cigarettes provided by the U.S. government. And, and if they didn't get this, these people wouldn't be alive today. There are people with multiple sclerosis, people with glaucoma that would go blind without it, other people with very, very rare, strange diseases. And yet um, the government, while claiming that this has no medical value, is 
providing it for people with med for medical purposes. So there's a, there's a brazen contradiction there. And, and also, the United States government classifies one of the compounds in marijuana, the THC, the high causer, as a medicinally active agent. It's actually a Schedule three drug, which is considered a drug that's relatively safe with very little abuse potential. And yet marijuana is put in category of what's called Schedule one, a drug considered having no medical value and being dangerous. And yet the main compound in marijuana is considered by the federal government to have medical value. It's these kinds of contradictions. When people look at it, you know, it makes you stand back and scratch your head and, and make, I think one, it behooves one to be quite skeptical of pronouncements from federal officials, given the rather sorry track record they've had about cannabis. And I say this knowing full well that, you know, one has to take, one has to look at skeptically uh, claims on all sides of this debate, uh, claims for all the great things and all the negative things. One has to scrutinize all the claims carefully. Martin Lee, are you there? Uh, well, I, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. Well, we've just lost Martin Lee, uh, the author of the new book, Smoke Signals on Cannabis Sativa. And you're listening to Here's to Your Health on the LA Talk Live radio network. We're going to take a very short break, and we'll be right back after these important messages. to enjoy the Maori lifestyle. You can have it all by owning real estate on the paradise island of Maui. Dennis Rush, a 22-year Maui resident and real estate broker, brings his wealth of experience and market knowledge to add value to your Maui real estate understanding, providing a level of service as unique and exceptional as the island of Maui itself. The magical island of Maui was voted the most exclusive resort island in the world by Condé Nast Traveler and keep in mind Maui is only a simple non-stop flight away. Hawaii Business Magazine Top 100 Realtors awarded Dennis Rush the 2011 fourth top realtor on the island of Maui. Go to www.dennisrush.com to view all of the amazing properties currently available in the Maui MLS system. Whatever your needs or desires, Dennis Rush will provide a private consultation for any Maui properties your heart desires, you will be in good hands. Once again, go to www.dennisrush.com. That's www.dennisrush.com. Contact Dennis today to start your Maui lifestyle now. Dennis Rush, proud sponsors of the Dawn Christie Show and LA Talk Live. Are you tired of getting sick and tired? Are you tired of doctors not knowing what's wrong with you? D Herbs may have the answer. D Herbs, number one in herbal remedies. D Herbs' main goal is to enlighten and properly educate people to the importance of human health and nutrition. D Herbs, home of the full body cleanse. Everyone needs to cleanse. If you eat meat and dairy products, you need to cleanse. If you're eating processed foods, you need to cleanse. 90% of today's diseases that we suffer from are diet related. Cleansing opens the door to healing and rejuvenation. Whether you need help with a chronic disease, weight loss, or to jumpstart and eliminate fatigue, D Herbs Full Body Cleanse can help. There's a better way to live and healthier way to live. Experience healing. Visit us at dherbs.com. That's D H E R B S.com. Or call us at 866 434 3727. That's 866 434 3727. Oh, your skin looks great. Thank you. What's your secret? Frankincense and myrrh oil by Ancient Essence. Frankincense and myrrh oil by Ancient Essence? Yes, it's a beauty secret used since the time of the Greeks and Romans. The spa in Malibu told me about frankincense and myrrh by Ancient Essence, and now my skin is lovely. Well, your skin looks great. 
Call Ancient Essence at 1-800-627-9813. Discover the secret of beautiful skin. Call 1-800-627-9813. Discover the secret. Frankincense and myrrh oil by Ancient Essence. Discover the secret of beautiful skin. Available at fine spas and beauty centers. Joshua Lane, member of the board of directors of Dr. Anne Wigmore's Hippocrates Health Institute, Josh Lane was part of the Dr. Anne Wigmore team that brought wheatgrass, sprouts, and raw foods to a worldwide audience. And now the host of Here's to Your Health on LA Talk Live, Joshua Lane. We're back. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Here's to Your Health on the LA Talk Live radio network. I'm your host, Joshua Lane. And our guest is Charles Haywood, who has been a guest on my show before, who is talking about and is a practitioner of what is called reflexology on the hands and feet. Charles Haywood, welcome to Here's to Your Health. Thank you, Josh. Thank it's you. nice to be back. You were here last time, and you worked on one of the interns, and I believe she was very impressed how much better she felt, and she had never heard of reflexology, and she was rather fearful, and uh, she liked it. It was a lot of fun. She was a lot of fun. <laughs> so what is reflexology? It is, um, I'll give you the definition, yeah. Josh. It is the art, science, and study of specific touch techniques that are applied to the feet, hands, and ears to remove stress to allow the body's own energy to flow more freely to promote natural healing. Okay. All right. And this technique, you studied this, uh, you learned from an older an older man, a practitioner? Book? Yes. It, I'm, I'm in my 12th year of practice now. Uh, I first started doing reflexology professionally in 1991. I'm sorry, it was 2001, actually. <laughs> 2000. Okay, yeah, right, 2001. 2001. Okay, 2001. Yeah, 2001. Yeah, but my, my time, time flies by. It does, it yeah. It does, really. It does. All righty. So, now... Before we went on the air, you tried an experiment with me, which seemed to make me stronger. Can right. you tell me about that experiment? Well, if you, if you notice what I'm wearing. You have a I pendant. Need. Yes. 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 This is a scalar energy pendant. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I'm using with my healing touch of reflexology now. And what it does is it strengthens the body's energy. But it's also a shield. So we are, uh, in our modern technology here in the United States, we're bombarded by Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic frequencies. Right. This sh pendant shield protects us from that invisible pollutant that's all around us. Right. And those those, those pollutants, while there's some controversy about that, most people kind of admit that, yes, it seems to be potentially these are problematic. It has a drain, an energy drain on the body, and, and most importantly, it protects our brain from the microwave energy coming from the cell phones. Right, right. There's a lot of contrary about the cell phones, but again, a lot of science seems to feel that indeed they, to use a cell phone on a regular basis held close to the head is probably not a good idea. Oh, uh, for sure. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> right. Now, on the reflexology, we have, uh, uh, for those of us who are listening on iTunes, they can't see this, but those watching us on YouTube and Ustream, etc., see the chart you have, the foot chart. Yes. And the hand chart. And why don't you explain to us what these charts mean? Well, number one, these charts were actually created by doctors, mm -hmm. by, by uh, medical doctors uh, here in the United States back in 1917, and uh, Dr. William Fitzgerald and Dr. Uh, Joe Shelby Riley in 1923. These two uh, medical doctors, and they were surgeons, they uh, created these charts mm -hmm. and, uh, and wrote a couple of books about them. So there are over 7,500 nerve endings in the body, and these charts represent those nerve endings. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's extraordinary. So that's just this is just science. Absolutely, total yeah. science. Right. To total science. And I've I've worked on people and had them say, well, I can feel something in my head. Yes, yeah, well, I'm working on your neck. You know, things like that. Right. So it's it's very real. Right. So the body is uh, interconnected. Yes. And this reflexology simply recognizes that and then uses it to heal us. That is correct. In other words, there are micro systems in the body mm -hmm. and redundant systems in the body. So what happens uh, as a reflexologist, what I do simply is to mechanically reduce and eliminate the stress that forms at the end of these nerve endings. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, a variety of things happen. Number one, the body relaxes. And it enhances circulation. And let me be real clear about what that circulation is. It's not only blood supply, but it's nutrient supply, 
its nerve supply, its oxygen supply, mm -hmm. and its energy supply to every organ and gland in the entire body. The body, f a person feels better, the body comes back into balance, and the body functions better. It's extraordinary. And it's non-toxic. Non-toxic. It's, it's very terribly conservative. <laughs> right. So, so it's, it's, there's, there's zero downside to it. So let's say a person has a headache. So what, what do you do? Well, I could uh, work on their hands uh, in the wrist area and actually uh, reduce their headache and oftentimes get rid of their headache uh, within 10 minutes. By working on the hand? Yes. Right. Be and, and when you work on the hand, you're bringing circulation to the area. What I'm doing is I'm reducing the stress uh, that's causing the underlying cause of the headache. Usually it's some form of stress and tension. I see. And as a result, reducing that stress, allowing more circulation to flow, the person relaxes and the pain dissipates. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, that's actually pretty impressive. And th these, these charts are very interesting. So I see that by looking at the fingertips, the fingertips seem to work in the head and sinuses. Right. The uh, uh, these are called the, the metacarpals. The, the bones are called the metacarpals, mm -hmm. whereas in the toes, they're the metatarsals. So, so that, what are they in the hands again? So metacarpals. Me metacarpals. Metacarpals. So the, um, they're actually horizontal regions of the body. Mm -hmm. So the fingertips represent the horizontal region called the head and neck region. Just below the fingertip, which would also be a similar point, um, the, the palm of the hand, the ball of the hand, yeah. is the ball of the feet. That's the mid-abdominal -ab region. And then the lower part of the hand is the lower abdominal region in the wrist area. Same way with the foot. Wow. The heel of the foot. Hmm. So those two maps are very, very similar of the hands and the feet. And of course, the thumb and the wiggling of the thumb, that yes. bending of the thumb, that's the neck. So it's the head, the neck, and the spine is along here. Same way with the big toe. As the big toe bends, there's the neck, and the spine, spinal column runs along the side of the big toe, inside the foot. Well, that's, that's actually very impressive. <laughs> that's very impressive. Uh, do you work on some athletes? I do. Uh, I work on, on, on runners and, and a variety of different athletes and, and bodybuilders and, and just all sorts of uh, athletes, yes. Can I hear that again about the neck on the thumb? That actually, that seems terribly subtle. I, I like that whole idea. <laughs> Let me hear that once again if you don't okay. mind, Charles. Keep in mind now, the head and neck region uh, encompasses all the metacarpals uh -huh. and all the metatarsals. Yes. So all the fingers and all the toes. Right. However, very specifically, I like for a headache example, I would work on the thumb and right where the thumb bends is the neck region as the neck bends. And their they're, they're vertebrae endings were, are all along the inside of the palm of the hand. So I've got the head, the neck, and the spine all along here. Hmm. And as, as I go down the spine to where the base of the thumb is, I'm looking at the lower lumbar region of the back. So I've been able to get, help people with sciatica problems uh, by working this area. People have sciatic problems maybe because they don't exercise enough or because they're runners, they're running on pavement. You can, you can help them yes. overcome by, by simply working on the hand. Yes, the body the gets feet. out of alignment from, from that activity, and, and then it, uh, it, there's pressure being put on the nerves, mm -hmm. which causes the pain. So I have found that the reflexology touch helps to reduce and eliminate that pain. Wow, that's just really... That's really, it that seems wonderful, and uh, your explanation is very clear. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, we're uh, uh, speaking with Charles Haywood, who is a reflexologist here in Los Angeles. And Charles, where is your office, by the way? Please? Well, actually, uh, I'm based out of uh, West Los Angeles, LA Health and Wellness Center, uh, at the corner of uh, Sautel and Olympic Boulevard. And it's, it's integrated practice with acupuncture and chiropractic and massage. So in nutrition, we do a variety of things there. And where are they, once again? On Olympic Boulevard at the corner of Sautel All right. in West Los Angeles. Now, you mentioned things for runners, you know, the neck, et cetera. Uh, what about digestive stuff? I see we have small intestine, we have the colon, pancreas, stomach. So let's say a person mm, has a lot of gastric distress. Yes. Which could be from you know not eating carefully, et cetera. What can the reflexology do? Well, reflexology has been known to be very helpful with people that have digestive problems and respiratory problems. Oh. In, the, in the digestive area, uh, it's been helpful with uh, constipation. It, it, it improves the, the blockage in the intestinal tract because I can work very specifically on the large intestines and the small intestines by simply working the palm of the hand. 
Wow. So you can you you can improve the healing vitality of the body yes. by doing massage. I mean, if a person's going to eat Burger King and French fries and Coca-Cola, not to pick on Coca-Cola, the, <laughs> they, they could have some gastric distress for sure because the choices are not really you know, the, the best choices. They're going to be a little clogged. They could be a little clogged. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Kind of a kind way to put it. Yeah. And can you actually take someone and just pick up their healing vitality? Let's say someone says, I'm just tired out. Yes. And suddenly you work on various parts of the hands and feet, and all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, people think, I have lots of pep. Yes. Uh, what I have found is that someone who is um, you know, low in energy, for example, right. reflexology is very unique because it not only relaxes the body, it energizes the body as well. So people go to a very deep state of profound relaxation. During, when, you, when you're working on yeah, it. Yeah, during a session. Uh, sometimes they go to sleep. Oh. Sometimes they snore. Huh? That's how deeply they go. And uh, when they come out of that, there's this blissful sense of well-being that they have. And as they start to move around for the rest of their day, they find that they have more energy than they did before. Because you have... I've de-stressed them. That's right. I, them. Yeah, number one, I've, I've really lowered their stress right. level, uh, put them into a state of deep and profound relaxation. And when that happens, Josh, that's where the parasympathetic nervous system of the body takes over. That's where the rejuvenation takes place. That's where the healing of the body takes place in that deep, deep state of relaxation. So when I bring them out of that, uh, they feel a little sleepy, a little groggy, but they feel totally refreshed. It's almost hard to describe how good they feel. And once again, the theory is that by... Is the word stimulating correct? You, you What are you doing exactly? I'm actually... Uh, you could say I'm reflexing over the nerve endings. All right, reflex, and, and you're reflexing over the nerve endings, and the result to the uh, client is that they have greater flow of energy in the body. Is yes. That part of, yes. Uh, Enhanced else? circulation, improves energy flow, uh, absolutely. Wow. And, uh, okay, so is, are you mostly used for like, well, certainly back problems, you know, when your back is out, you're, you're in trouble, and most Americans, or many Americans have problems with their back, possibly not from exercising, not stretching properly, yes. they're eating too much sugar. But certainly, if you could work on them, hands and feet, and make the back feel better, people would think, "Oh my God, I don't need. I, don't need, I might not need surgery. Possibly, I might not need pain pills. I can just, you know, and actually have a nice day." Yeah, because it allows the body to really come back into balance, and really improves uh, how the body feels and the function of the body as well. It's it's extremely uh, extraordinary, and how quickly it works. I've had many people ask me, "Well, Charles, how long does it take to get some results or some?" Mm -hmm. Uh, from the reflexology session, I said, you'll notice something right away. Like in two minutes. By the time I right. finish, you'll notice something. Yeah, that's, that's always impressive, isn't it? People people might be skeptical, and all of a sudden you work on them, and they think, oh, my God, I, that guy was right. I can't believe it. Yeah, I've had people uh, uh, on my table, and they have uh, sinus problems, allergies, things like that. Mm -hmm. Nose will be clogged. And before the session is over, by touching the right areas, it un unstops their so nose. that's actually very impressive. Yeah. So when someone is congested, they have sinus congestion. Yes. By actually working on... Their fingertips. You can actually, at least temporarily, they'd be less congested. Absolutely. That's remarkable. I've, I've had it happen numerous times. Numerous times, yeah. All right. Now, having mentioned that about sinuses, is there anything that reflexology really doesn't address? Let me talk very... Let me mention very quickly what it does address. Okay. And then I can say, and more. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and keep in mind, this is... Scientific research has, has proven this to be so. It is known to have helpful benefits when it comes to headaches, migraines, neck aches, back aches, respiratory problems, digestion problems, insomnia, constipation, arthritis, TMJ, sciatica, and the PMS gets rid of cramps. And it go, the list goes on and on. Well, and that's on certainly on. a lot of things that this simple and safe remedy does. Yes. Yeah. All right. This is really, really extraordinary. And and I, one of the things I want to emphasize is that uh, I sometimes call the reflexology massage, mm -hmm. but it's a different touch technique than traditional massage. It is done primarily with the thumbs and with the fingers, but mostly with the thumbs. And it, because the thumb is so, so powerful, is that it? It's just that's what reflexology is. True reflexology is is reflexing over these nerve endings with the thumbs. That's impressive. During a break, I'll show you. <laughs> <coughs> All right, that'd be good. <laughs> and what about, so hands and feet, we have the feet chart right. here, 
and so it's just it's the same idea, different part of the body. And right. I see we have the charts there. So that the toe near the neck, and then it just goes down to the heel. Right. You can see where the thyroid gland is there. Thi Th where's the thyroid? Right across. Oh yes, yes. Okay, yes, I see that. Yes, thyroid. Yeah. And a lot of Americans have problems with their thyroid. That's yes. just a pretty common uh, problem. Right. Oftentimes, sugar is a factor in thyroid problems, and of course, uh, cigarette smokers have problems with thyroid. Yeah. And people exposed to a lot of radiation. Like yeah. every year, they get a dental X-ray, which they probably don't need. Over a long period of time, you get too many X-rays. It's bad for the thyroid. It's usually due to some form of malnutrition. Malnutrition as uh, well. But the yeah. reflexology can help to improve the the energy and oxygen and nutrient circulation to that area, which can improve the function. Wow. Are there any kind of, is there a remarkable story you can mention without mentioning anyone's name? Someone said, oh my God, I just feel such and such, and you just worked on them and they suddenly realized, oh wow. Well, I've, I've had a couple situations over the years. Uh, I was doing a sample on a lady once on her hand, and it sample took about eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And when I finished, she said, my migraine's gone. I said to her, well, I didn't know you had a migraine. She says, not anymore. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> and that's by working on the neck area. Is that you work on the neck area? Yeah, I was working uh, on, on her neck and this area just below the base of the thumb is called the big web. There's a bundle of nerves right in here. Uh -huh. So I worked on that area. Uh, it just, just part of my, just doing a, just showing her a little sample of what it feels like. And I was able to relieve the stress and tension. Is that also the bowel area? No, the bowel area is going to be, you know, in, in the palm of the hand here. Palm of the hand. Yeah, down here is going to be your abdominal area here. And so right here, this is not the, what, what is this called? This is called the big web. Big web. Yeah, the big web. There's a bundle of nerves in here. It's also a very common place to go to for pain in the body. It's the number one place to go to for pain in the body. Is that a pressure point that the martial artists also use? I'm, I don't know if, about that for sure, but I know that we use it in reflexology. Kind of wake the patient up. Should they fall asleep on you? You it, press it, that and it, it wakes them right it, up. It definitely helps with pain. Huh. And again, this is called the big web. Yes. That'd be a good, be a good name for a, for a miniseries, wouldn't it? The Big <laughs> the, Web. The right. Big Web. Could be a moneymaker, Charles. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And uh, by, by working on this, uh, this will do what for a person? Uh, it helps to relieve pain in the body. It's the number one spot to go to for pain in the body. The number two spot to go to for pain in the body mm -hmm. is in the ears. What? Really? Where on the ears? There's a, there's a point in the ear uh, that's very good for, for pain. I see. Yeah. I see. Wow. Uh, we're speaking with Charles Haywood who is a reflexologist here in Los Angeles. Uh, we're talking about reflexology today, and you're listening to us. Uh, this is Here's to Your Health on the LA Talk Live radio network. Charles, let me have your address once again so people can contact you. Um, I'm at uh, 11340 West Olympic Boulevard in West Los Angeles, uh, suite number 138. Zip code is 9064, and my website is reflexologyla.com. Charles Haywood, it's been a pleasure having you as my guest on Here's to Your Health. Charles is one of my regulars, and you're listening to Here's to Your Health on the LA Talk Live radio network. I'm your host, Josh Lane, and we'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Charles. For more information about the guests and sponsors of Here's to Your Health on LA Talk Live, please call us at 818-707-0005.